The Nation Network presents Coming In Hot with Brent Wallace. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brent Wallace. Welcome to Coming In Hot. He is our special co-host, Jason York, 13-year NHL veteran, 757 NHL games, and always a Spangler Cup champion. Yorkie, how are you? Nice drop in with that Spangler Cup. Hey, that's one of my proudest uh, moments, by the way, and probably most enjoyable. It's a great spot. Yeah, like I always wanted to cover a Spangler Cup. No, awesome time. Uh, you're up there for two weeks up in Davos, Switzerland. Unfortunately for the players, you don't really get to enjoy all that great German beer up there, but I brought my family up. Uh, we ended up winning a silver medal, and it actually got me back to the NHL as well. I uh, ended up going to Boston the next year, but uh, great times up there playing. I did a whole year in the Swiss League, Wally. Probably, not probably, without a doubt, the most fun I've ever had in my life playing hockey. It was a blast. Uh, we'll get into playing in Europe in another time because there's lots to talk about. I, I think it's one of the best kept secrets if you're a, a player who's maybe not in the NHL of playing in Europe just for the experience. Uh, we will get to that later, but lots to talk about today. The show is always brought to you by Renfrew Pro Tape. Go to RenfrewPro.com. Uh, they are the ones with the green core. They are the ones with the worldwide leader in tape, for, especially for hockey sticks and for shin pad tape. In fact, they invented it. Uh, RenfrewPro.com. They are the number one choice when it comes to tape. Um, and I still got to get back to you why you switched from black to white tape because that's a, for me, as far as I know, a big change in the middle of your hockey career is to switch, start switching what? colors. Why is this so yeah. fascinating to you, switching from black to white tape? It's not like, be like one because, thing from the switching because, like skates or, or stick brand, but tape is tape. Like, red, the no, red tape it's is not. better quality, but white and black? Honestly, it was as simple as this. I wasn't a goal scorer. I wanted to see the puck better on the blade of my stick, so I went with the white tape. Went with the white tape. And, uh, Did it work? And that's all it was. Ah, let me think about that. You know what? I had my best year using white tape. It was in 1998. I had the white tape on the stick, and I think I had uh, 35 points that year with white tape. But man, I got this stick on my, in my basement right now. I should bring it up for one of the shows because this thing, I need to roll a boat with it. This, is, this stick is <laughs> absolutely, t- it's terrible. Weighs about 20 pounds. It's from a company called, Bran- remember Branches? No, of course no. not. Nobody ever heard. It, was a couple, it was only around for a couple of years, but it was a, one, a 120 flex, 120, and a little wood blade at the end. It, it was awful. And hey. I tell my kids, I go, I use this when I played, so you guys can't get it done with these new stuff, and there's something wrong with you. That's so awesome. Um, all right, we got lots to talk about, so I got to get going here. And that is, uh, first up, uh, the story came out today uh, from Sportico that the Ottawa Senators are indeed officially for sale, uh, valued at $655 million. Uh, but, A, it's been rumored for a while, Yorkie, like, this, this really isn't that news. And I will say, I want to say about seven weeks ago, I think there was members of the organization reaching out to potential buyers to say, listen, we're trying to do something here soon. If you're going to make a bid, I suggest you start to think about it now. And now we're starting to hear that that's what they're looking for. Yeah, no, no, for sure. It's, it's no secret. Ottawa is a small town. There's been all kinds of rumors with all kinds of different people wanting to buy the team. Um, all I can tell you, is there's a process to go along when you're, when you're going through this, when you're trying to buy a team. And if you don't follow the protocol, uh, we all saw what happened back when I think it was Jim Basili was trying to buy uh, into the league. Yeah. You, you, you got to follow the process. You got to do your due diligence. Um, but I do know this, the, the team, there, it, it has been actively out there, like you said, uh, looking for interest. Um, and I, I think it's a matter of time. Because uh, when the team does, in fact, move downtown, you got to have really deep pockets to, to, to finish this job off. So does that involve um, partial ownership, full ownership? Uh, did the Melnick daughters stay in? Uh, what percentage? Do they stand at all? All this stuff will work itself out in the future. Uh, but but I, I do think, I don't think that it will eventually go downtown. And it, it's going to take more than just status quo to get this done you're going to need other partners deep pockets uh, and eventually we're going to have one of the i think the greatest entertainment 
venue in Canada. And that's what people forget, Wally. We all talk about the Ottawa Senators, and you and I were talking about this before we came on. It's only 41 dates during the year. This is so much bigger than just the Ottawa Senators. This is about making a, a fully functional um, venue down at LeBreton Flats uh, that's going to involve all kinds of dates where you got to fill that building. And that's where a lot of the money is going to be made, along with the real estate and what, what other else has developed down there. So, yeah, the Senators are, are very important in this deal. But in the big scheme of things, there's all those other dates that really give to a lot of people that want to own this team. And that's the other thing, and you talk about it, is the arena right now is not funded. And that's a big part of what people are talking about of do they have to, do they not have to, do they sell the team now before they get the funding to build the arena downtown? There's a lot of balls in the air. The other one is obviously from the last deal that didn't work with LeBret, and there's the billion-dollar lawsuits, you know, between John Ruddy and, and the Melnick Group. And so that's uh, that still needs to get worked out. And I think that's slated – to be in court in January, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so there are lawsuits pending. There's all kinds of stuff, but that's, that's the interesting thing of how this all ends up being played out and how it gets funded. Um, and we, and there are several groups uh, that we hear, at least um, we talk, we, you hear other names that are get mentioned. One of them, um, the things is, is how much interest there is in this team and that there isn't any chance that this is getting moved. I see this every once in a while pop up on social media. They are not moving <laughs> there, this franchise. Well, like, it is, there it's is, nearly impossible. There is, there is zero chance the Ottawa Senators get moved out of Ottawa. Zero chance this happens. And, and we're all seeing this now. The excitement in the city, the, the, the people that are coming back. There's a buzz here again. Uh, and, and and once this does move down to La Breton Flats, it's it's going to be something really special. It's just until then, there's going to be lots of talk. There's going to be lots of speculation. But anybody that thinks this team is getting moved is crazy. This team isn't going anywhere. No, and that's the thing. So we'll see how this plays out. Um, I know you made uh, some money in your career. Maybe you can buy the team. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's... I own I own the tier two junior A team. That's about uh, as far as I'm going. As far as the uh, the deep pockets go, Wally. Uh, I'm retired from ownership. I, I've already sold the team. Uh, I've moved on, and we're doing a podcast now. I don't got time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> think think of how much your life has changed. Now you're sitting with me every day. Uh, all right, let's <laughs> let's move on. Sends in Tampa. Brought to you by BEI Bonisher Excavating Inc. They are uh, the leaders in excavation in the Ottawa Valley. They are um, helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. If you need agri, give them a call, 613-432-1120. Remember to slow down in construction zones. BonisherExcavating.com. Okay. Um, Sends in Tampa. Now, I want to point out a couple of things. I don't know how to get through all this, but one of them is Tampa uh, and Florida are really tough places to play. We always talk about going to L.A. and Anaheim and San Jose, that Death Valley trip. But why is it that teams struggle so much playing uh, in the hot Florida sun? Is it just because it's nice there and teams take the time off? Uh, in the last 36 visits Ottawa has made to Florida, uh, they are 12-19-5, and 7-9-2 in Florida and 5-10-3 and with just three regulation wins in Tampa tough so you you tell me what happens yeah well you, you could make the argument that tampa has been a really good team for what the last five to seven years so you, you put that in the equation yep. but you can't say the same thing about the florida panthers because they've just became i'm gonna say a, an upper echelon team in the last couple of years i'd say number one when you play in florida the ice is awful uh, and, I, and i know it's still not it's better but when you get on those conditions as a player, it gets into your head a little bit and the ice is bad. I remember playing at Anaheim and that was actually a little bit of home ice advantage for us because our ice was so bad, but we were used to it. We were used to picking up bouncing passes, bouncing pucks. So you got a little bit of a home, home ice advantage is that. But as far as the, the temperature and the weather, I don't know. It's Here's one for you. When I was playing, we had a great record playing in Long Island with New York Islanders. Why did we have that? I don't know because we weren't we were an okay team but when we went in there we just seemed to have success i just think there's just certain places certain teams that your team is made up to play well against and for some reason uh ottawa just struggles when they go play florida and tampa and uh 
Can you put a finger on it? It's tough. I, with Tampa, easy, easy answer, though. They've been really good for the last five to six years, so yeah. tough to beat really good teams. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, this, you know why you played so well in Long Island? is because you stayed in a hotel across the parking lot from the rink and had nowhere to go. That's why. What a piece, what a piece of crap. That <laughs> hotel, that, that was the Marriott. And basically, number one, yeah. when you stayed in the Marriott, I remember when I was with Anaheim, Paul Korea and Timo Solani had to go under aliases because these friggin' fans would call them during the day and say, hey, Korea, screw you, you're going to lose tonight. And they'd hang up, and they'd do it right <laughs> right during your pregame nap. So Korea and Solani started coming in their aliases so they wouldn't get called by fans during the day. Like, you'd think that wouldn't happen. Eh? They'd get call the hotel, get through, crank call guys between two and four before the games. And then, well, you remember this, when, when you walked over to the Nassau Coliseum, if you were a popular player, it was about a it was a five minute walk that turned into about forty because there was so many. We call them back. They still call them seekers. So many seekers uh, on the way, just intercepting guys. But yeah, that 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 hotel was was awful, and the crank calls made it worse. <laughs> it was tough. Uh, all right, so uh, they're in Tampa tonight. There's a couple of lineup changes we'll talk about. Um, here we go with tail of the tape, if you will, uh, brought to you by Renfrew Pro Tape. Uh, we're going to give it uh, some little stats on tonight's game. Um, the Ottawa Senators have one point in their last four visits to Tampa. Uh, zero. The number of Tim Stutzla's points on the road this season. Three. The number of points by Claude Giroux on the road this season as he leads all Ottawa Senators. And six. Total goals scored on the road by Ottawa, who are still searching for their first win on the road. They need to find more offense, uh, Jason York. But the big thing today is moving Eric Brandstrom up on the first pairing with Thomas Shabbat. Is that what you would do, as DJ Smith says he needs to get the puck up to his forwards? Is that the right move? I think it is. And I, was, I wasn't sure how Brandstrom was going to play this year. Uh, and I will say this, when you're in that third pairing, and you're only playing 13, 14 minutes a game, kind of like what Branstrom was doing last year, it's really tough to play the style of game that, that he likes to play, which is puck possession, hold on to the puck, make some plays. Now that his ice time has been elevated, he's got some confidence. I think he had a pretty good summer of training. But for Branstrom, I don't think he's ever going to be a great defender. I think he can get good enough. But here's the thing. When you have the puck on your stick, you don't have to defend. And you're playing with Thomas Shabbat, you should have the puck more often than not. And if Ottawa wants to create some offense, you gotta you got to figure out the best way how to get the puck, like DJ said, in the hands of your forwards. I would, I would, I would guess, I'm not going to guess, I'm going to tell you right now what's going to happen. Shabbat and Branstrom are going to play the majority of their shifts with one of the top two lines because you're going to have to have those guys on the ice to try and get some offense going. Offense comes from your defense. It starts with that first pass. And I think with Branstrom, I'm really interested to see how he plays tonight. I think he's had a great start to the year so far. Uh, I, I like the move a lot. I, I think, and also too, Wally, what other option do you have? Like, who else are you going to put in that position right now to, to play with Thomas Shabbat? Like, I, I like how Sanderson's played so far with Hamannick. That's, that's been a pretty stable pairing. After that, wh what's your option? There's not, now with Zub out of the lineup, you're pretty limited on what you want to do. So out of the lack of options, Bradstrom, but, but also too, I, I think, I think it is a very good and calculated um, move by DJ. Okay. So does that mean uh, Holden and Zaitsev will see minimal minutes? And uh, I guess your reaction to Nikita Zaitsev being in the lineup, would you put Dylan Hetherington there? I would, I, I would, if it was me right now where the Senators are and how poorly Zaitsev plays, you can't sugarcoat it. He hasn't played well. I think he was, was he second in ice time last game? He was up at 22 minutes. He's really struggled. Mm -hmm. But if, if you play him with a guy like a Shabbat, then you're asking him to make plays because Shabbat's not going up the glass. He's not going up the wall. He wants to, 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 to take the puck back, make an escape move. And that's what Branstrom can do for you. He can go back and create some separation when he has the puck. Zaitsev can't do that. So with him and Holden, it's going to be a very simple style of hockey. 
it's right up or D to D and right up. You're not holding on to pucks. You're not bringing pucks back. You're getting that puck and you're getting your first option out of your hands as quick as possible. And for Zaitsev, that, that, that's the way he has to play. He just doesn't have the skill. He doesn't have the skating at, at this point in his career to, to be that type of player. So put him down to 13, 14 minutes and just ask him to play simple. Probably spend some time on the penalty kill. I, I think he's not a bad penalty killer. But by no means can you play him in your top four. He cannot be on the ice when he's playing with uh, the Batherson line or uh, the Drew line because they want the puck. So you get, you get Branstrom out there, he's going to make a, a nice little escape move, buy some time, and then get the puck in your forward's hand in a, in a lot better fashion. Can they win with the D currently constructed as it is? And, and the reason I say that is there just doesn't seem to be that physical type presence on the blue line. Shabbat and Brandstrom aren't knocking you around. I'm going to say Sanderson and Hamannick, mm, not so much either. And then Holden and Zaitsev will see minimal time, and they're not overly physical. They just don't seem to have anybody that's going to punch you in the mouth. <laughs> okay. If you look around the league, though, Wally, how many defensemen would you classify when you look at other rosters of good teams? Like I'll take Colorado, for example. Who on Colorado is going to play that style of game for you? I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but when you, when you think of your... The blue well, line, I was going to say, take prayer. Tampa, like tonight. Like who, who's, like, who's Victor Hedman's going to punch this? you in the mouth. No, he's not going to punch you in the mouth. Yes, he's going he to is. Puck on so you're, he's going to have the puck up. Victor Hedman is more physical than all the Ottawa Senators. Come on. Victor Hed he doesn't have to be physical. He's six foot six. He has the puck all the time. He makes... All he does is block you out with his big body and takes the puck away from you. I, the game's changed. I, I don't think you can have that one-dimensional guy that just punches you in the mouth and, and cross-checks you in front of the net. you, you got to be able to move. you got to be able to make plays. And I, I was thinking about, just back to Bradstrom for a sec, I was thinking about him today and, and what type of player that, if he wanted to emulate, where, where he could actually have a career in the NHL and be successful. He should watch Sam Girard play. And if, if you want to pick a defenseman in the league that, that, that I think he should emulate, it's, it's Samuel Girard. And he's small. He's got a little stick like Brandstrom, but he has the puck. He makes nice spin moves. He's not their number one guy, but he's in the top four, and he drives possession. And, and I think that's what Brandstrom can do for you. But as far as them not being physical enough, I think they need another veteran defenseman that can play in your top four. Uh, and it's now with Zuba to line up, it's, it's, it just shows when you get one of your Zuba or Shabbat hurt, you're, you're, just, you're, you're left in a very vulnerable position like the Senators are right now. So I think they go with this for now, but uh, it's, it's, it's no secret that defensemen just aren't available right now. And if they are, you got to pay a huge price. And like, you're not, you're not going to trade a, a Pinto or a, um, or one of your top prospects right now, you're going to wait and see, see how it plays out, and then see if you keep winning and you're in a position, then then you go out and make a move like that. It's a different, it's a, well, not a different, it's a delicate line to, to balance, right? Of you want to win now, you've told the fan base, we are going to try to push, we are going to be competitive. And then by the time we always talk about American Thanksgiving, if you're out of it, it's tough yeah. to get back into it. Yeah. So do you like, do you have to make the move now? That, that's the pressure. I'm not saying they do because I think that they're not, they're going to have to overpay to do it, but that's the pressure that they're, I think they're under. I'll go back to something management. I think, I think Pierre Dorian said this in the summer and I think people have to get the difference between winning and they kept saying, we want to play meaningful games come the spring. And, and for yes. me, that means you, you want it. You want to be in a position where, whatever, it's February, and, and you're already out of a playoff position. When this season started, Wally, I know everybody was excited with all the moves they made in the summer, and I was like, well, hold on a second here. They made some nice moves, but they didn't bring any defensemen in. And you heard your coach just say that uh, today at his press conference. We need guys that can move the puck. They don't have that right now. And, and I think this team will, will continue to be not inconsistent, but until they do shore up that blue line, you're going to have nights like you did against the Florida Panthers where you can't get the puck out of your own zone until this young group, like a Bernard Docker, is ready to play. He needs some more seasoning. 
and that's going to take a while. Sanderson, as much as I love him as a player, I think he's, uh, he's going to be a superstar in this league. He's going to have some growing pains as well. And then you've got Zaitsev back there. You've got an older Holden. And you've got Hamannick, who, you know, he's, he's doing a good job back there. But is he really a top four defenseman at this point in his career? I think that's asking a lot. So if people think this is a playoff team as it's constructed right now, I, I, I think you really have to think about that. I think they're going to be exciting. They're going to play very uh, entertaining games, very offensive games. But until they fix this blue line, you're going to have a lot of nights like you had against the Florida Panthers. Uh, and the last question I have on the blue line, Thomas Shabbat. We talk, it seems, constantly about his ice time. It's been a, that conversation for at least the last three years. But again, he's playing 25, 26 minutes a night, 25-58. He's only had two games this season under 25 minutes. And last year, uh, he had 35 games at over 25 minutes. The Sens went 11-22-3. and three. So people are saying they need to cut down his ice time. They need to limit him to at least under 25, to say the least. You played a lot of minutes when you were an Ottawa senator, and if I'm not mistaken, led the team in ice time a couple of years. Uh, is he playing too much ice? And one of the reasons I think his ice time is up and because the record is poorly when it is, is because they've got him on the ice trying to win games. And so now they play him more down the stretch so that they can try and win those games. And that's why the record looks the way it does with over 25 minutes. <laughs> well, number one, who, who, who are you putting on the ice if you don't have Thomas Shabbat on the ice? Uh, especially when you're the coach, you keep looking down at the end of the bench and you see Shabbat, it's your best option. And going back to your comment, when I was playing a lot early in my career, 20, I, had, I think I had 24 minutes a night, and that wasn't uh, over 25. I found when I did go over 25, I was tired. But it's totally different right now. The rest the players get is incredible. They've got, I, think I talked about this last time we, uh, we did the show. They've got a sleep advisor. Uh, after the game is done, you're not going out. You, they have meals right at the rink. They've got protein shakes right for the guys. The rest in recovery is second to none, what you get right now. So yeah. playing 24 minutes when I did, comparing to 26 now, I, I don't think it's that tough because you're not practicing hard anymore. And there's a lot of different uh, variables. You're, you're, you're getting on a charter. You're, you're traveling first class. Is it tough? Absolutely. But these guys are in better shape than they've ever been in. They're, they're way more flexible. They're not as big and bulky as they used to be. Thomas Shabbat is an effortless skater. I think people are reading into this way more than, way more than it is. Um, it's something to talk about. It's a talking point. Yeah, sure. In a perfect world, would you love to play him a little bit less? But, but, but who are you putting on the ice? We just talked about Zaitsev struggling. Are you going to up his minutes right now? Uh, you got Zuba to line up. So unfortunately, it, it is what it is right now. You, and, and also too, like there's pressure to win right now. And, and if you're the if you're DJ Smith, you're Jack Capuano, the D coach, there's pressure. I'm not saying there's pressure right now that you're going to be fired, but mm. if 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 you all of a sudden you you go in and you lose again tonight, and then you I looked at the upcoming schedule for the Ottawa Senators, it's not a cakewalk coming up compared to how this team started the game the season. Like you 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 got some games that were pretty advantageous when you got to play the Boston Bruins who were missing the two best players. You had played the Washington Capitals minus Tom Wilson, minus Nicholas Backstrom. I thought they had a, 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 a real solid game after that. I was at Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh game. Um, but now they're heading into a stretch wall where you're, you're playing some teams like we saw the other night, like a really strong Florida team. This to me is going to be, I don't want to be a cliche guy and say measuring pick. But tonight's going to be a game I think you really got to take notice of to kind of see where the Ottawa Senators are at and where certain guys are at right now with where they are is what type of pro they are. Are you are you really ready to take on these types of minutes? And look at a Castellic right now. We'll, we'll get to see firsthand. He's going to play third-line center. We'll see how Pinto does playing against a, a very good team at second-line center. So great experience for the younger guys. Uh, and... Uh, pay attention to how the Ottawa Senators play tonight because the stretch they're uh, approaching right now is going to be, uh, it's going to talk a lot. Uh, by the way, congratulations to Shane Pinto today, named the uh, NHL's Rookie of the Month for October. Of course, we all know the, the sizzling start that he's hit, he has had. Uh, 
you talk about, I guess, the the measuring stick game or whatever Tampa is. Does it also not need to be a response game after that game they played in Florida when they gave up 58 shots? Was it 58? I would say in 53. Holy cow. That's a lot of 53 shots. 53 saves. Eight. Yeah. 53 saves. Okay, I knew I heard of 53 somewhere. Yeah, for sure it's a response game. You had a tough skate. Uh, I know you had your, your Halloween party in there, and you also lost the game, so it was a two-fold meaning to that, to that bag skate. But I, I, I think you're going to see a response tonight. I think you're going to see this young Ottawa Senators team come out hard and, and uh, give these Tampa Bay Lightning uh, uh, a lot. I, I think it's going to be uh, – this is a nice thing about a young team. Short memories, you come back from the beating like you took, uh, at least statistically-wise, in the shot clock, and – I would, if I was betting on this game right now, I would say this, the Senators are going to have a very good first period. All right, Tampa, by the way, is just returning home after a three-game road trip, which we always, see, every once in a while, see that there, there's a little lag as the, the home team starts to, to get back under its feet. Um, so when you see Anton Forsberg in goal, are you impressed with the way he's been able to play? And I will point out, by the way, Anton Forsberg won his very first NHL game on November the 1st. 2014 uh sorry played his very first game november the 1st 2014 columbus at new jersey just thought i would throw that in there because i did my research <sighs> he's been good like uh, especially too like how, how busy he's had to be with talbot getting the injury early on in training camp no. i like how he's played he's, he's given ottawa a chance well look at the last game against the florida 58 shots and somehow this team still had a chance to to potentially we could at least a point in Florida, and that was all because of Anton Forsberg. So he's given him a chance every night. I like him. You can tell the team likes playing for him. You can tell they like him as a guy, and that's important. Yeah. Uh, I remember um, I always sat close to the goalies, and when you have a guy back there, you know he's competing, you know he's working. He's a great story, too. Like this guy, nothing was given to this guy, and, and players – really love playing for guys like that. They had to grind. They had to earn it. Nothing's been given. So he's a great story. Uh, if, if I'm uh, a guy on that team right now, I love playing for this guy because he, he competes like hell back there. And I think his last two games, both losses, but I think his save percentage is over 920 in each of those. I think 930 in the, the Florida game when they made 53 he's, saves. He's so great. Yeah, he's, he's been a reason they've been in a lot of these games. Uh, Finally, last question I have for you before we uh, we head out for the day, and that is uh, you talked about Jake Sanderson's play and what you've seen from him. Uh, 18.57 a night. He's got four points. He's plus four. He he looks comfortable. I, I know there's going to be a game or two he's going to have an off night, but he just looks effortless on the ice. And maybe I'm wrong, but you're the D guy, so you tell me what you see in his game. Well, I watched him play – I think it was his second exhibition game. I sent a tweet out and I said, this guy, if everything falls into place, he's going to compete for the Calder Trophy. He's going to have to get some points, obviously. The points. He is a guy that is mature beyond his years when I watch him. He gets the puck. There's no panic. And usually when you come into the league and you go back for a puck, if you don't have a play, you're rimming it. You're getting rid of it. You're trying to get the puck off your stick as, as quick as possible because you don't want to make a mistake. Nothing seems to rattle this kid. He's calm, he's composed, and I really like how he defends. He's, 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 he's got a real tight gap, a great stick, and I saw a couple times, I saw him against Toronto. I, also, I remember that one particular play when Austin Matthews tried to challenge him wide. Uh, didn't panic. Good stick, good body position, and did a real nice job on Matthews. I think when it's all said and done, uh, he is without question going to be Ottawa's best two-way defenseman, and he's going to be a very good player in this league for a long time. And, uh, short sample size, but there's nothing that I see that tells me otherwise. He's got, he's, he does no, there's no holes in his game right now. And he can do, is he going to be a first power play guy? We'll see. Uh, but I, I think guys that can defend, skate, uh, get the puck in transition like Sanderson can do, those guys are so valuable. Uh, I think uh, Ottawa got a very good one in, uh, in this draft pick. So, uh, which leads me to, I mean, you started with Detroit so, and you started with a team that was building towards becoming a very good hockey team. Were you nervous playing uh, your first oh. year? What was it like for you? <laughs> okay. 
first of all, I, I cruise into a dressing room, my first NHL game. I'm late for the game because I was so stupid. I was at the airport and I was, I was waiting for a guy with a sign that would say, uh, Jason York, we got a ride for you. So I ended up uh, calling the rink and they're like, the trainer answers the phone of Joe Lewis and he's like, hey kid, get in the cab and get to the rink. He can warm up starting in a half an hour. So I get to the rink and there's, there's, there's Iserman, there's Fedorov, there's coffee. I'll never forget, Iserman sees me walking in at like, as they're walking on for warm up, he's like, hey kid, 100 bucks, you're late for the game. <laughs> I'm like, head down, got my gear on, got on the ice for the last five minutes to play my first game. But different time, different culture back then. Rookies really had to earn their place in the league. Uh, I, back then too, there was no salary cap you know what Detroit's payroll was in 1994, 95? I think it was $80 million. Wow. $80 million. Isn't that crazy? Pre-salary yeah, cap. They did spend a lot. You had, Eis- you had Eiserman, you had Cicerelli, Fedorov. Mark Howe was still playing. Brad McCrimmon was there. But when you were young back then, it, it was a lot different. Like, you, you just – you really had to earn your place. You had uh, – veterans that were protecting their jobs uh, a lot of money wasn't given out early in careers so there was it was um it was it was it was different but i wouldn't trade it for anything well it was it was a lot of fun man like especially those so, uh, on that team how, how did you play in your first game after being late then not very good <laughs> probably <laughs> The puck was like a firecracker on my stick. I would just get it and shoot it up the boards, just just playing not to make a mistake. And also, too, don't forget, you go back to mid-90s, the, the game didn't have the rules that it had in place now. So you could hook, you could hold. There was, like, a lot of crap going on during the play after the whistles. You had guys like Probert, Joey Kosher, Stu Grimson cruising around the ice, like, it was just a totally different time. Like it was, it was intimidation was still a huge part of the game in NHL. So like if guys got at a line, there was a fight. Like it was just, and anybody that's watching this or listening right now that watched hockey back then knows what I'm talking about. It was a totally different time. Uh, I'm not going to say it was better hockey or worse time because you can't compare it. Today's game is so different, but that, that mid nineties hockey, it was, uh, it was it was entertaining. It was entertaining because there was a lot of different variables. You had skill, you had toughness, and you had some of the biggest, meanest heavyweights you would ever see in, 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 in hockey. Like that was a time when I like to say the dinosaurs were running wild with these guys. Like, like that was remember Tony Twist, Wally? Like Tony no Twist, way. like when I was on the when I was on the ice, I tried to avoid this guy because <laughs> like if, if you hit him the wrong way or man, like you, like it was, there were some, there were some guys that could uh, do a lot of damage to you, man. There was, it was, there were some tough customers. Did you find yourself in one of those? I got forced to fight a couple times. Uh, th- I, I think this one's on YouTube too. It's a pathetic display of fighting by me because if you tripped a guy, if you tripped a guy, you would be, the wrong guy. He'd make you fight. And I, I we were playing the Devils, and Lyon, they had a tough team. They had, uh, they had Old Lion, they had Olawa, Randy McKay, Ken Danico, and we basically on Ottawa had nobody. We had, I think we had Andre Waugh, and that was it. And so I forget what happened, but I, I said something to Old Lion during the, during the play, and I, I called him brutal or slow or ugly or whatever. And then the rest of the game, he looked for me after every – whistle he was looking for me and finally late in the game he joined the play and Rose, Damian Rhodes was the goalie and there was a whistle beside the net and I go I'm looking okay oh, shit here he comes Old line comes in and right away starts face washing me gloves come off I'm like all right I guess I'm fighting so it wasn't much of a fight I was just grabbing on because he had I think at that point he had about 100 fights to my maybe two so yeah basically Old line forced me to fight him and all I was making sure was I didn't take any punches to the head. And if you watch it on YouTube, I think you see Rhodesy's glove coming at the end, and he's put on top of Oline's head trying to push him off me. But uh, <laughs> no, it's like it's like when I watch when I watch a game now, and I see uh, guys tripping after the whistle. I'm like, man, 
you don't know what would have happened if you would have done that 20 years ago, especially if you chirped the wrong guy. Like, you're, you'll, you'll get yours. But, hey, I'm not saying it's worse or better. It's, it's just a totally different time. So. It is it is a different time. Um, and with that, we will end it. I promise not to have uh, any fights with you unless, unless it's fighting words. That's all I'll do. So, uh, <laughs> until Friday, when I see you again, Yorkie, uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we will see you next time. You're uh, watching Coming In Hot, brought to you by... Renfrew Protein. We'll see you next time.